Good morning, my grandchildren and my friends from afar. Woke up this morning and got myself in uh, in a good long study. The, the, the uh, chapter one is not all that long, but there's a lot of dissertations with uh, with this book of Jonah. And uh, so I read through those things and kind of gleaned what I could. And uh, before we get started in this uh, study, let's ask the good Lord for some for some direction and for us to receive that what he wants us to receive because boy I tell you this this story of Jonah it'll take you on a fancy uh, a fanciful trip here it's got so much spiritual likenesses and things in here that you really kind of have to be on your spiritual toes so to speak uh, to grab on uh, grab on to the wind as it were, as we read through this book. Let's ask the good Lord for a little guidance and, and help on this book, should we? Uh, Father, please watch over us as we read through this beautiful book of Jonah, Father. Be in our hearts and our souls and our minds, Father. Help us grab on to those spiritual significances and uh, deeper spiritual meanings of this book, Lord. We're asking you to reveal to us, Lord, that which you would have us be revealed. We love you, Father, and we need you. And uh, this is why we're asking for your help, Father. It's written that if we ask you for bread, we won't receive a serpent or a stone. And we understand, Lord, that this is when the heart asks you for spiritual things. And we're going to try to open up our hearts, Lord, and ask you for some good direction, Father. And we know that you're going to give us what we ask for. Lord, we love you. We need you. Forgive us for the times when we don't realize just how much we love and need you, Father. Father, we believe. Amen. Well, that being said, the book of Jonah. Here's some dissertations if anybody's interested in reading this and old Bully's commentary notes here. Bully makes some uh, interesting notes. I'm going to try to pull his camera back. And if you, you're interested, you can steal that uh, camera. And enlarge that screen, maybe. Some of the newer phones, you can do that when you steal a video. And you can read through these uh, notes of bullies. A bully I call, affectionately call Bully. E.W. Bullinger is his name. And he's an old numbers hand. This guy's a, he keeps up with numbers and uh, all kinds of other ideologies. This one here, I thought was very interesting. If anybody wants to pause and read that. But uh, in uh, this, uh, I'm also going to skim over uh, Matthew's, uh, what do you call that thing? Dissertation, I think is what you call that. But uh, let's kick off in Jonah and let's hope for a, a good sail, a good trip here. Let's, let's ask for a good voyage and uh, see what we come up here. Number one reads, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Metaiah, saying, now I looked up that Metaiah, and it means truth, certainty, faithful. It's got a lot of good qualities, all the things that we look to uh, for God. And uh, this is uh, his son. And it's no uh, mystery that Jonah is a likeness for Jesus Christ. Uh, there are many likenesses for Jesus Christ, but these are not Jesus Christ. So, uh, the picture doesn't have to be fulfilled in a way that only Jesus Christ for, could fulfill. Which brings me to uh, the notes that Matthew Henry made here about uh, uh, the death of uh, Jonah uh, as to be a, a lie. I think this is where it was. You know, was a Jonah sacrifice himself, save a nation? Would explain. The, uh, yeah. So I uh, <laughs> have to keep in mind a likeness is just that. It's a likeness. It's not a. It's, uh, it's not a, uh, there's only one Jesus Christ. So, uh, but uh, I thought it interesting that this, this uh, Jonah, his dad, his name uh, meant uh, truth and certainty and faithful. And uh, if you trace that down to the Strongs, uh, you will see all those uh, different words that, uh, matter of fact, I got to turn to that page. That uh, the Strongs brings you to 573 and you can see what these words are. And it says, uh, where does it say it? Uh, from 571. So then we go to 571. Uh, El Meth is what it means. And it's from uh, 539. And it means uh, stability, figuratively certainty, truth, 
uh, tr trustworthiness, assured, establishment, faithful, uh, right, sure, and true. All these things that, uh, that uh, is synonymous with God's name itself. All these things that God tries to protect. God has to protect the integrity of his name, and thus he does. And he still finds a way to give us uh, forgiveness in that endeavor and to protect his name. That's what a God we have. Uh, he's, he doesn't have to turn around. He doesn't have to change himself. He has to change us, and change he will. Arise, go to Nineveh. Uh, this is what uh, the word of the Lord saying. Now, this, there's more to this story that I think is in these older books. I think King somewhere, uh, they were talking about this story where we get into where Jonah was getting off on the deep end, trying to hide from the Lord and stuff. But this story kind of moves very fast. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. And this means in the old tongue, it stinks to high heaven. This uh, wickedness of people, God's looking down on what these, these children are doing. These same children with all this great potential and all this great prospect, and uh, we are spinning our wheels. Now, in our time, uh, we do that same thing. We do it in the carnal by living a carnal life. And we could be living a spiritual life. We could be putting God first. And uh, God is basically saying here, this stinks. This, this, uh, there's a mess going on here. We need, a, we need a, uh, a message of deliverance to these people so that they can turn around. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarsh. Um, from the uh, presence of the Lord and went down to uh, Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarsh. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it uh, to go with them unto Tarsh uh, from the presence of the Lord. Now this, I should have looked up this word Tarsh. Let's see if uh, they makes mention. This is in three, uh, three rows up fleet. Uh, Tarsh, see note on Kings 2.10, from the presence of the Lord. To me, this is a likeness of a carniality. Because we all tend to do the same thing. Let's see if I made a note here. Uh, we all tend to run from God's uh, uh, desire for us. Uh, we are afraid of the giants. We were then when God's trying to get us to cross that river Jordan. And we are today. We can see that river. We can see that there's a spiritual promise to a promised land on the other side. But we fear the giants. And what are our giants today? Well, how is the world going to look at me if I get all holier than them, holier than thou? If I get all, if I get all in tune with the Lord and I got to give up cussing and drinking or give up being a jerk, and how is my friends that that's all we do? Cut up and kid around and watch our sports and laugh about everything in the world and this is a completely different thing than what God wants me to be these are giants in our lives and there's also other giants there's our jobs there's those giants there's our marriages maybe my wife will leave me maybe my husband will leave me if I take up reading the word of the God in a spiritual fashion when I start talking about things that they can't see Maybe I'll lose my marriage. That's a giant. Maybe my kids won't respect me because the world has taught them that it's unfashionable to be a man of God. There's another giant for you. So we are all still afraid of our giants. And uh, this uh, Nineveh, I mean, this, uh, this Nineveh here has got uh, Jonah uh, running pretty scared. Now, if you, if you give creed to the thought of what uh, Henry, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, Bully, Bully says here, that uh, this could be an act uh, that uh, something Jesus would try, that he knows that if Nineveh would fall, it would better his chances for his people Israel uh, to survive the judgment that's coming against them. So in his mind, he might have very well been thinking, let's just read what this note says here so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Rose up and flee. Uh, Jonah knew that the Assyria was to be God's sword of judgment against Israel. If Nineveh perished, Israel might be saved. God's mercy might arrest this overthrow of Nineveh. 
Uh, was this why Jonah's uh, would uh, sacrifice himself to save his nation? Question mark. Uh, this would explain his flight here and his displeasure, as clearly uh, stated in uh, verse in uh, chapter four, verse one through uh, three. Uh, then he said in verse 12, take me up. Think about Jesus being took up on that cross. Take me up. I guess that means etc. And uh, with a little a capital C there, I'm not sure. Uh, but I always kind of think that means etc. He had countered the coast. He confesses to the men in verse 9 and uh, 10, but not to God. He gave his life to save his people. A type of Christ may be begun here. Now, worthy how much creed you give that or not, it don't really matter, but I mean, it's a possibility. To pretend that we know what's in the head of, uh, of uh, Jonah, is uh, uh, that thought can grow the more you think on it. But for I figured it was worth mentioning that there it is. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarsh in the from the presence of the Lord and went down, I think we already read that, towards the presence of the Lord. Okay, let's get on four here. But the Lord sent out... Wait, did I read this? Uh, let me back up and read three. Forgive me, I'm getting old and and, uh, and uh, getting cloudy as I get as I age. So let's go up to three. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tar Tarshish uh, from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarsh. So he paid the fare thereof. We're still paying the fare every day of our lives, aren't we? Trying to get away from the truth, and went down unto it. And go uh, with them unto Tarsh from the presence of the Lord. This is a carnal state of being. And boy, how we like to cling on to that. We may not like to admit that in ourselves, but there's still a big chunk of ourselves, no matter how spiritual we become, that we like to hang on to this uh, ship, to this trip, getting away from the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind unto the sea. Now I notice that uh, this sea is always a likeness for waters, which is a likeness for the many peoples. <laughs> we can think of this ship as a ship of fools that is trying to uh, uh, keep us uh, um, to keep us from what we need to be, and we're always buying tickets to new things, are we not? And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. How many times do you feel like you're just about to be broken? Could be the death of a loved one, a friend, or God forbid, a a child or a parent. We're always on that edge to be broken. We always keep reaching back for something in God to uh, strengthen us in this. This word of God is our strength. But this, uh, this life often seems like a ship tossed in these strong, boisterous uh, uh, winds, these uh, storms. And it's a scary place to be. But don't worry, help is on the way. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God. Now, this is a, a small G God here. And these guys are not, uh, these guys do not know the God of Israel, but they don't know it, but they're praying uh, to him right now because there is only but one God. And when you see uh, men that shows reverence to a God that they don't know is uh, not a real God, a, a man-made God, when they're, praying, when they're praying for loved ones to live and, and praying for sicknesses to pass. God hears that. Don't you think that he don't? God, no, because these are the same people that's going to pray to the capital G God someday. These are the same people that's going to discover the story of Jesus Christ and the story of the God of uh, uh, Jacob, Israel, and, and uh, I forget what they usually say that third one is, but they, he, he's, we're all coming around. So this is why... Uh, we're fixing to see some here that'll witness to this here in a minute. Just hang on, and cast forth the wares uh, that were that were in the ship into the sea. Now, we do that ourselves. We cast out this. We cast out that. We we cast out all the things. We try to quit drinking on our own. We try to we try to be better people on our own. But guess what? That old ship's are still a raging, ain't it? There's only one cure. For the raging of this ship, the raging of these storms, there's only one cure, and this is going to be the sacrifice, and that sacrifice is Jesus Christ. 
Uh, we're, uh, the ship were into the sea and to lighten it up of them. We're, we're still trying to lighten up everything. This is why we're clicking on these YouTubes today and looking for uh, some old guy reading the Bible. We're, we're still trying to lighten our ship. We're still inching our way toward that wonderful and beautiful revelation of Jesus Christ, trying to get in touch with that Holy Spirit, that Holy Ghost. This is when these words uh, not only make sense to our carnal, but then they start making sense to our heart, our love, our faith, all those wonderful things that, uh, that uh, Jonah's, uh, his old daddy, um, Amenitai, all those things that uh, his name represented. We're trying to get in touch with that. We're trying to lighten up this ship. But Jonah... Let's see if I've skipped something here. God and cast forth the wares of the ship into the sea to lighten up of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And he uh, lay and was fast asleep. Now, what's this remind you of? Wasn't there a story in the, uh, in the uh, New Testament where uh, there were some more men that were in the ship? And they were afraid from a, a boisterous storm, a, a temptuous sea. A violent storm. And it seems like I remember. Now, I also have a memory when they saw Jesus walking on the water, which I don't know if that's the same storm or not. But it seems like I have a memory of Jesus being down below in that ship, and he was calmly sleeping. Let's see what I made a note here. Uh, think of Jesus asleep in that ship in that storm. Uh, then I said, we must awaken our relationship with Jesus. Notice relationship has the word ship in it. Our relationship. These are all these people that are in this boat, in this one little ship. Relation. What's our relation with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it carnal or is it spiritual? Uh, this Jesus Savior, this likeness for a Jesus Savior, he's asleep in that boat. This means we've got to awaken something. And what are we trying to awake? The very thing that's going to give us salvation. They know that, uh, though they don't know it yet here, but when they get this man thrown off of the ship, they're going to be saved. When we get Jesus on that cross, through our treachery, through, our, through our, all of our failings, it's going to redeem us. It's going to save us. This is the monsters we are. We have to kill the thing that we necessity and have to love. Ultimately, our love, our Savior, we have to kill it so that we can be saved. Remember those guys? They were all so well studied in this Bible. The Jews back at that time, they had all the books, had all the, uh, the old spiritual writings. And we couldn't see Christ in him because he didn't come as we thought he would come. He ended up coming like a thief in the night. Come and gone. They didn't even know it. Enough said there. So the shipmaster, this is the shipmaster now, not just the captain, but the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Your, who's your shipmaster now? It's most likely your ego, your ego, your yourself, that thing that stands within that, that place of, uh, that uh, holy place that uh, temple that ought not claiming to be God. That's your shipmaster. This is yourself. This is your carnal man. He's saying, uh, come unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Now we're looking at a capital G here, aren't we? Call upon thy God. Uh, if so, be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Isn't this what we're all here in this Word of God for? Aren't we all here in this ship? This ship of fools. We're all turning to these pages and we're all reading. And we're all looking for one thing. We're all looking for that capital G. And we're all asking, what is it we have to do, Lord, that we won't perish? Interesting thought, is it not? And they said... Every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Funny thing about casting lots, it worked. These guys believe in a small g God. They believe and they're casting lots and they're making prayers and God's hearing every bit of it. If you pray to the God of the Muslim gods, what do you say there, kiddo? <laughs> Hello. 
Hello. If we, no matter what God we're praying to. Hey, <laughs> my love. You having a good morning? Yeah. Has Nana got us something cooking? She cooking. I hope so. Papa's getting hungry. We're painting. Y'all are painting? Okay. That's yes, awesome. Skywa is painting. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, Papa's going to be in there with you in just a minute. I got to finish up my reading now. Okay, my love? After you're done, then you'll come eat breakfast? Yep, because I'm hungry. Me too. Okay. okay. Good deal. I think we're going to oh. have grits and eggs. Oh, good. My favorite. Okay. Come and let us cast lots that we may know. Oh, we already read that. I was talking here. God hears you. Don't think because you may not be praying to the Lord Jesus Christ right now that God ain't listening to your prayers. You may be praying to what the uh, our Muslim uh, cousins call Allah. You may be praying to what our Asian uh, uh, brothers call uh, uh, Buddha. You may be praying to all. But look, there's only I'm one God. And you what? I'm going to the barn. Go to the barn already? Oh my goodness, child. We ain't even had our breakfast yet. After we eat some breakfast, we're going to head that away, okay? Okay. We're going to ride the bikes and stuff. Pop up will be in there in just a jiffy. Is it raining? No, I hope it ain't raining. Okay, that's what I would say. It'll be time to go after we get our breakfast down. Okay. okay. See you in a bit. And then say the Lord unto him, Tell us we pray. Oh, we, I had two talking about these lodge things. This is proof that uh, these things work. Papa. These guys aren't men of God. And the Romans Papa. would men of God at that time. Books. We will get some of them books Papa, in just... Okay, books. we will just in a minute, boo. Pop-Pop's going to read this hey, in Papa. first. And Papa. then we're going to do this. What, baby? Guess what? what? Tomorrow, uh -huh. tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and then tomorrow is going to be my cruise. Tomorrow, go. No, well. after Thanksgiving, and then after Thanksgiving, uh -huh. and then it's going to be my cruise. I know. Papa was going to be praying for you to have a safe journey on that cruise. And okay. Thanksgiving is going to be fun. I can't wait. Even has, has on the TV. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. Okay. My pipe's coming, hang on. Then said they unto him, I was talking about this, how these cast and lots things. God works through all people. We have one God for all people. And no matter how long it takes for us to come around to the uh, love and mercy of Jesus Christ, uh, I got faith in God's plan. We're going to get there. That book says every knee is going to bend and every head is going to bow. And I have to Where believe that God can have his desire. Close that door for Pop-Pop when y'all go out of that door to that kitchen, okay? So Pop-Pop uh, can hear himself, okay? Okay. Can I hear himself? See that door right there? There you go. Yes, sir. I'm going out. Yeah, go on. Pop-Pop's coming in there in a minute. And I'll see you in a minute. Thank you, my love. Uh, uh, I got involved in an answer for uh, a, a comment today concerning this. A guy had quoted when I said something similar to this, that there was only one way to God is through Jesus Christ. And this is very true. Our forgiveness is only paid uh, through that cross and that forgiveness. And there are many people in this world that, uh, that don't believe in Jesus Christ. There are many people in this world that uh, never have been afforded the uh, pleasure and the uh, afforded the uh, uh, the gift of reading about Jesus Christ or ever knowing Him. Some people die early in life and never get to know Jesus Christ. Now, our God is truth and justice and all of these righteousness things. That's His name. God protects that. Now, let's talk about a sense of fairness that God must have. If you have all these people that died in this earth, they could be little children, little babies that hadn't even been afforded to burn, be born yet, come out of the womb or what have you. Would it be fair, would it be justice for these, uh, these uh, lost souls or little babies that never knew about Jesus Christ that if they should die, that they should go to hell? God protects His name. God protects and holds together righteousness. If God is not righteous, he's nothing. God is righteousness. And through that love and mercy that he's trying to bestow on us, if he wants to bestow this love and mercy on you, guess what? 
He's going to afford every living being, every soul, that same mercy, that same forgiveness on that cross. Someday, some way. Don't stress your brains and try to think how this has to be. And don't start telling people what, how, what God has. We can't put God within our, in our own sense of justice. We can't tell God what he can or can't do. We can't begin to tell God what he will and will not do. God's got a way to save you and keep his righteousness completely intact and keep his name completely uh, varnish free of the degradation of this life. God, my friend, is the creator of everything. We're fixing to get to a part of it that kind of sounds something similar to that. And uh, so it is true that we can only come to that salvation through that cross on that work in Jesus Christ. Uh, how many, how many, uh, I'm not even going to say too much that will cloud up our minds, but just know that no matter what happens in this life, that cross is still there. That forgiveness is, remember who God is. He's truth. He's love. He's mercy. He's grace. He's justice. God's got a good plan. Let's trust it. Uh, then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee. Um, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? I think that's what that word is, occupation, yeah. And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what people are thou? And uh, the old uh, uh, Jonah is saying here, and he said unto them, I am, this is odd, this is the first name of God, I am an Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. This is the God of creation of all. He could have went on and on. Who made the sky? Who made the universe? He just on and on and on. Because God made everything. He's in charge and in control of it. Uh, then when the uh, men exceedingly, uh, then were the men exceedingly afraid. And said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the man knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he hath told them. He told them, I'm running from the Lord. He wanted me to do something. I'm scared. I thought I could, I thought I could duck out here. And, and if we give any credence to what uh, my friend uh, Bully here is saying, he, uh, he might be telling them, that uh, because uh, God wants to save a people that wants to destroy my people. He might be telling them something like that. And so I'm trying to be a, I'm trying to stand up and be a, uh, what do you call that word? A, a predecessor, not a predecessor, but a, somebody who stands up to save somebody else. He, he might have been telling them that. But for right now, let's just kind of keep our thoughts into the, what the word here is telling us. The presence of the Lord, because I had told them. And he said they unto them, What shall we do unto thee, uh, that the sea may calm, uh, may uh, be calm unto us? Uh, for the sea wrought and was temptuous. This, this is just like that old sea the twelve was in that boat with Jesus. Same thing, same story, same same outcome coming here. And he said unto them, Take me up. Remember Jesus said one time, there should be no sign given to them but the sign of Jonas. So this is definitely uh, some parallel uh, writings here and trying to tell us something. One we see in the carnal, one we see in the spirit. Praise God, amen for it. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. Now this is probably where a bully gets this notion that all it was all along his, uh, his desire to let the people of... Uh, Nineveh perish in their sin so that his people could be saved. It's a great dilemma here, wouldn't you say? And take me up. And Jesus was took up on that cross. Take me up. He said, take me up, throw me over the rail of this boat and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm for you. What is our seas? The many peoples. Remember those many peoples that whore rides up on that dragon, that, uh, ch that church of confusion. Uh, many peoples, until we get the spirit of Jesus Christ, that revelation of Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our in our beings, we're going to be in a tempestuous sea. We're going to be in a crap storm, as uh, I could say, uh, almost said the uh, 
S-H-I-T storm. But let's go with crap storm because this is what this world is. We wake up in the middle of it. This storm becomes tempestuous. It's life. You wake up with all these impossible things you have to achieve, to these impossible laws to stand up to. You can't. Your marriage falls apart. You get hooked on dope looking for answers somewhere else. We are in a crap storm in this world. It is scary. It is fearful. Then you have the impending death coming upon you and the death of loved ones. We are frightened. We are scared. These giants are fearful. I know that for the sake of this great temptress, is a, I see, uh, uh, throw me into the sea, for the sea be calm unto you, for I know that my sake, this great temptress is upon you. He's going to try to get him out of the jam we're all in by serving up himself. He couldn't, you know why? He couldn't save the world, but for this little model here with a likeness for Jesus, he figured he could for this model. Jesus did this for the world, my friend, the entirety of this planet and who knows what beyond and how much and how more, how many more. I believe that if God created this planet, he can create many planets with beings and souls on them that uh, we don't, may not know anything about. We don't have to. Our salvation is here. No matter what we're going to find out when we pass from this silver cord from this world, how big God's creation is, we've got the, uh, the answer to it all on that cross. A fine pinnacle point uh, for the answer and the key to it all. No matter how big it is, no matter how much of a giant this understanding is, we've got the key to it. Nevertheless, those five smooth stones that David picked up out of that river, remember? Praise God for him. He only used one. He picked up five. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. You're rowing hard today. Many of us has rowed hard for 50, 60, 70 years reading this Bible, rowing hard for our lives. Never being able to grab on to that revelation of Jesus Christ and be in contact with that Holy Spirit. But yet we can quote chapter and verse to many scriptures. Go to church every Sunday and still wake up on Monday either a drunk or a wife abuser or uh, somebody, a guy that may be as mean as two snakes in a jar half the time, only being a Christ-like part of the time. Are we not rowing hard, trying to get to salvation, trying to get to that shore? But the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. You ain't going to defeat this sea on your own. You're not going to read this Bible and read yourself into salvation. It ain't going to happen. You could study this Bible till you're blue in the face, my dear friends, my grandchildren. This is not where your salvation comes from. Your salvation comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and what happened on that cross. And only through giving up self, that old self that stands in that temple, that claims to be God and claims to be you're in control, claims to be in control of the ship on this boisterous storm. Only when we surrender that to Jesus Christ and the work done on that cross can we have our forgiveness. Therefore they cried unto the Lord, capital L here, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we, give, uh, we beseech thee, and let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. Don't make us kill this old boy. We like him. He's a pretty good fella. He seems like a man of God. Don't put this blood on our hands. And thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. We got to realize sometimes that every crap storm we're in in this world, it pleases God. Why? Because this is the process in which we are purged of our impurities. If we had a good time all the time and nobody died and nobody suffered, we would never learn anything. We learn through our tough times. This is what makes us hard uh, against the hard ways of the world. This is what gives us a conquering soul that we can achieve. We can wrestle these words of this Bible and uh, what's that word that that angel said Jacob did? And prevail. We got to go through hard times. We deserve every one. It was our fall that brought it on. It was looking away from God is what brought them on them. It's through these tough times and through these tears 
we're going to look back to God. And pretty soon we're going to find that cross with that Holy Ghost on it. Not just Jesus 1.0, but Jesus 2.0. That's that spiritual, that's that revelation of Jesus Christ. It's coming. Can you hang in there long enough? The Lord has done and pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. You're going to cast up, you're going to, one of these days, you're going to pick up that Jesus 1.0, that old carnal understanding. You're going to pick up that carnal understanding we have of Jesus Christ, and we're going to cry, we're going to crucify it. Where? In the place of the skull, Golgotha. You ever think why that place was named the place of the skull? This is where we take up that Jesus and cast and say, Lord, I can't, I can't deal with this carnal understanding. I can't figure it out. This is when we surrender. This, in the place of the skull, this is your carnal understanding. And you crucify that Jesus 1.0 so that you can receive that Jesus 2.0. This is that spiritual revelation of Jesus Christ. This is why that last book in the younger of these two twins, the New Testament, is named the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is where Jesus is revealed to you. This book is not about a bloody, gory end to your flesh bodies. It's about a wonderful glorification of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dear God, I love these children. Uh, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and uh, offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Isn't it about time we make this sacrifice unto the Lord? Isn't it about time we can take this old carnal understanding of Jesus Christ, what I call Jesus 1.0, because everything's in uh, we, uh, our metaphors, are, uh, we understand computer metaphors these days. One point, this is an outdated version. This is when we try to figure out God with our brains. We try to figure out God's story that we're reading here with our old brains, our carnal understanding, our, our logic. God supersedes all this with that revelation of Jesus Christ. This is that Holy Ghost this Bible talks about. This is that Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is trying to write these words on your heart. Not just your brain, but your heart. This is where we surrender to love. This is where we start actually acting like Jesus Christ and not just talking about Jesus Christ. This is where mercy actually starts flowing through us. Not just something that hits on us and bounces off. It actually flows through us and now we can behave like Jesus. Now we can help others come to that gospel. Because now we have a better understanding in our heart what this gospel is. What do these guys do? They made vows. Praise God for it. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. And this struck, struck out at me kind of loud. Prepared. Now this is 17. Let's see what he says. Prepared. It, it means appointed or assigned. God just didn't cause his fish to show up. He prepared it. Appointed or assigned? Are we appointed yet? Are we assigned? What is our assignment? Our assignment is one thing when we're in the carnal understanding of this beautiful book. But we're appointed and assigned another thing when we receive this Holy Spirit of this book. Praise God. He prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Our old carnal nature swallowed up Jonah. But don't worry, help's on the way. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days. How many days was Jesus Christ in that earth in, that, in uh, three nights? Matthew Henry had a beautiful way of putting that. I'm not going to try to find it. This old video gets long enough. And my, my breakfast, I think, is on the, on the table. So I'm going to skim over these. And if you have an interest... And I advise everyone that loves, loves the Word of God to do some reading in this Matthew Henry's uh, beautiful uh, dissertations 
and uh, explanations of what these scriptures can mean to us spiritually. Uh, the man is still a man. He doesn't get everything what I would consider to be uh, right. Or I'm, that, that's not even the best way to put that. The best way to put it, it doesn't pertain to him in the time he lived. This guy lived in two to three hundred years ago. I'm not sure how long, but it was a long time ago. So some things that are more evident to us in our time being how we live so much closer to what we consider to be the end of this time or the end of days. Now, there may be other things that this Word of God will speak to us that wasn't necessary for this man to hear. And uh, I say that about all these old guys uh, from hundreds of years ago, but I also have to realize that these people had a much clearer path to the Word of God than we do today. The English language was a mathematical equation. I've mentioned this before, but there was a good movie I saw Mel Gibson and Sean Penn in, and it was about the guys that configured the uh, one of the famous dictionaries. And this is back about the time this guy here was writing this book. In some fancy college, they were put together some, one of those famous dictionaries. Oh, I got some up here. I forget which one. What do you call them? But uh, uh, some of those, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, diction, uh, Webster's or one of them. But in that movie, if you ever watch that movie, you realize that it, these words are mathematical. And uh, it was a story about these guys came across a, some problems, mathematical problems they couldn't solve. Sean Penn had played a, a murderer, a killer that killed his wife out of passion of crime, I believe. And uh, he was in prison. And uh, the guy that was in charge of getting all these people, these heads together, the, the, the big brains of the day, he put an advertisement in the paper saying, hey, I got this problem. I need how to solve this. And these papers would circulate throughout the countryside. And lo and behold, it fell in uh, Sean Penn's cell, jail cell, and he knew the answer, and he filled it out and sent it back to the guy and in the, the, uh, who was uh, Mel Gibson's character, who made another wonderful movie, uh, The Passion of Christ, uh, who's a, a staunch Catholic uh, dear brother. And uh, he's, he spends a lot of time thinking about uh, uh, perpetuating uh, such stories. Yeah, but anyway, uh, he, the uh, Mel Gibson character goes meets the uh, killer in the jail, played by Sean Penn, and uh, through their relationship, evolved, they solved many mathematical problems of the English language. Now, from back at that time, when you learned English language, you couldn't just make up a word to mean something it didn't. Words had to make sense. And through by the English language, uh, it was much easier to find the spiritual significance through the Bible in the way that the English language had to be represented. You couldn't just make up a word that didn't mean uh, something like uh, today, uh, the word for homosexual is gay. You, you, we just took that word and stole it right out of a, out of a, the mathematical common sense of what gay meant, and now we just gave it to a whole group of people that had nothing to do with that. We, we have a tendency in this life and in this world to change order, to change things the way God created it. <laughs> we manipulate the English language. So then we read modern-day scriptures and translations. <clears throat> We easily get confused uh, because words didn't have the same uh, mathematical equation and uh, it, it drifts. So uh, these guys from the old days had a uh, much better uh, sense of, uh, and uh, it was much easier for them to come to spiritual significance than what we have today. Uh, with so many talking heads, with so many scriptures, uh, translations and so forth, it gets a little tough. So when I read uh, the words of these old guys, uh, uh, by being in contact with, you're in more contact with the mathematical equation of the English language. You're more sharply in tune to it than if you read a, a modern translation. But hey, we can get the Spirit of the Lord through anything. God could, God, God talked to an ass one time. Uh, to, uh, was it Balaam, I think, in Balak? Um, if God can talk to an ass, uh, what is that uh, spiritually telling us? An ass was a beast of burden. And uh, we often call people asses when they are maybe not bright or not with their heart in the right place. And uh, we can learn from that. We can even learn from the devil, even if all we learn is that he's a liar. So it's all in what your heart is looking for. If you're looking for truth, God's going to give you truth. If you're looking for a deception, God's going to give you deception. So I guess there's our first rule in understanding, uh, grabbing onto that spirit. is that we got to adjust our heart. we got to adjust how we ask and what we ask for God. We ask him for bread. What bread are we asking for? Carnal bread or spiritual bread? 
We ask Him for physical bread? Are we asking for spiritual bread? What are we asking for? Don't just ask God for help. Ask Him for spiritual help. Ask Him for spiritual growth. Ask Him for uh, the thing that you're after. This is why we clicked open this video today, wasn't it? We're looking for spiritual clarity. We're looking for spiritual clarity. The word's clear is in that word. Clear. See how those words mathematically make sense together? This is how the old, uh, what do you call those people that put Christ on that cross? Uh, uh, that everything was, uh, the uh, Catholic priests read everything in. Uh, and they don't, is it Greek they call it? Or I guess it, Greek, Greek might be a word for it. But all those words, our medicines are all named after those because there's a mathematical equation there. I know I've talked about that. The old man's getting long winded. I love you. I got to get from my breakfast table. I got grandkids. I hear them getting impatient in there. I love you, grandchildren. And it's pop ups, uh, hopes, and dreams that you guys are going to seek the word of the Lord. And if one day you ever come to that point, I hope you remember that the old man put a lot of Bible studies on there that you can read along with him. When I, when I was a younger man, I'd seen old black and white grainy pictures of my grandpa, <laughs> of which who I was interested in. And I would so like to know what his voice sounded like, what his, what his uh, ideas, ideas of God were, and what his philosophies were. Today, in this time, we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to leave word behind in videos and emotions and in sound. That's a powerful thing, my friend. The Word of God can be, uh, can be moved through that... Uh, that sea, uh, just like it can our sea. Uh, God, the Word of God needs to be everywhere. In the internet, in the outer net, and everywhere. In our brain understanding, and our heart understanding. And this is a wonderful time that we are allowed to witness and be a part of. I love you guys. This is why I take the time to read these scriptures and get them loaded up every day. Because I like the idea of sharing something dear to my heart, to your heart. And that is, love. God has love. God has a wonderful good plan. We need to learn to trust it and start letting love be our filter as we read through these books. You'd be surprised at things the Lord will tell you when you let love be that filter. Have a great day. If you learn something or gain something from these studies, come on back and study with us again sometimes. Won't you? Uh, praise God for the day every day. Thank God for every day you get because we're not all guaranteed another day, my friend. So when God gives you a day, it's a gift. Use it for something good. Spend a little time getting a little closer to Him, won't you? I love you. Have a wonderful day, and come on back and read with us again sometimes. Pray, praise God every day for the day. Amen. Say amen. Say, I will. Say amen, little one. Say amen. Amen. No, come eat. Okay. <laughs> come eat. Amen. 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 Come down. Don't make that crazy face. Okay, I love you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.